spend the morning and uh, early afternoon with us just to learn a little bit more about cancer, about things that are going on. I want to just talk a little bit this morning about um, uh, the research that's going on, just a kind of a bird's eye view of things. And you're going to hear a lot more specific things when you go out to individual breakout sessions. And then also talk about things that the patient services committee can do for you as patients because we understand there's so many needs that you have and we want to give you some idea about things that we can do. Uh, before we start up though, I just want to show you a quick video. Um, hopefully this will work. Uh, My name is Brendan and I was diagnosed in 2004 with leukemia. Which was devastating to say the least. The dream has been for many years to try and harness the power of the immune system and target it specifically to fight cancer cells. Target therapy is the wave of the future. In the old days when people got chemotherapy or cancer therapy, the idea was to kill anything that was growing in the body. That's why people's hair fell out, because your hair is growing. Targeted therapy finds what's specifically wrong about that cancer. The Leukemia Lymphoma Society has made a huge impact on advancing the science and medicine of leukemia and lymphoma. Leukemia and Lymphoma Society has really filled the gap for us in terms of allowing us to continue to do the high priority cutting edge translational research which allows this transition from laboratory discovery to first in human clinical trials. They really have architected and engineered the state that we're at. A lot of the ideas that have come out of what they support is the way patients are treated today. The technology we have available now is much more powerful than it used to be. The downside is that it also is much more expensive. It really is a little bit ironic because now we're finally poised to really decode the way cancer works. What's amazing is that we have discovered all kinds of targets using this DNA technique, using this ability to look at the human genome to see which genes and proteins are being expressed improperly. We've got lots of knowledge in the laboratory. What we need are resources to allow us to take these ideas from the laboratory and make them available to patients in first in human clinical trials. Money is essential. You can't do this kind of research without money. Um, money also buys researchers and investigators time to do that research. Well, I think this is really a critical time for supporting research because we literally are closer to a cure. It's great to be involved in this research today because this is when it all changes. I just want to say thank you to everyone who gives, no matter if it's time, money, whatever they can, it, it means the world to their patients and their families. transition to the DVD and back. Uh, but what we've seen here in, in these researchers and their efforts, and some are really the top really in the, in the country, um, what we see here are the results of their efforts, uh, the efforts of countless researchers across the country. And what we've seen is the five-year survival rates to so many of these cancers has just improved dramatically over the last several decades. And it's come about because some of this cutting-edge research and the way we think about cancer is so differently than how it's been before. When we look over at the, uh, the last group of things, leukemia, that last red bar there, too, is the pediatric ALL. So th this is the exciting thing. We've made so many advances in so many of these cancers, but still, the, clearly, there's a lot of room to go. We still you know, won't rest until we have a cure available for every patient uh, available to us. And there's so much that's going on in the research world with regard to LS, LLS. The LLS is really the, the uh, largest uh, private funder of blood cancer related research in the United States and in the world. So only the, the U.S. government supports more blood cancer research than the LLS. So they do a tremendous amount of work here in supporting researchers around the country. We can see two, 318 grants and 22 contracts. There are huge grants that are, occur across multiple institutions. 
So they bring investigators across together who maybe in the past had not worked together. We are, we're busy, we have different things going on. So the ability to kind of bring people together to work on projects is crucial to making these significant advances. And we're beginning to see these advances occur right now for our patients too. They fund basic science research. You know, that we're looking at uh, how we can you know, foster the, the, the youngest generation, those young investigators who are just getting started out. You can imagine that if you're a young person, it's gonna be hard to go and compete for those federal funds, because those federal funds are very hard to get. What the LLS does, they step in. They take these promising young investigators and they give them funds to be able to start up their own labs to do this cutting edge research here. That's gonna result in the, the promising new therapies here for the next generation. And what we're also trying to do is we talked about building teamwork. Not only teamwork between different academic institutions, but building teamwork between the biotech industry, building teamwork between uh, them, the academic institutions, between the foundations out there, because everyone has to get together uh, to really kind of move towards goal of making sure that we have a cure available for all of our patients. And we have to identify what those unmet needs are. We clearly have seen that, you know, the five-year survival rates have improved considerably, but we're not at the point here where we can rest until everyone is cured. And we have a, um, again, beginning to bridge those, those gaps that have occurred between academia and also research between different academic centers because it's really only in those collaborations that we're going to make significant advances overall. And we have made significant advances, like we said. Uh, <clears throat> there have been uh, 21 of the 50 new cancer therapies that have been approved. have been approved for patients with blood, uh, blood cancers. So we're seeing a lot of therapies, and we're, we're also seeing, as someone who treats blood cancers, the, the treatments that we're seeing in blood cancers are not just kind of modest changes. They're big changes. We see some new drugs approved in other tumors types where there may be small improvements or small increments in improvements in overall survival. But we're seeing here, especially in the blood cancers, we're seeing huge differences. Huge differences with regard to overall survival, huge differences regarding cutting back in side effects. So we're seeing a big difference here, not only in uh, uh, the, the type of, the number of drugs that are being approved, but the significant advances that they're able to make uh, as well. And then the drugs that are approved for cancer research are also being kind of, you know, available, or in, in blood cancer patients are also being made available for um, other types of cancers too. So what we're seeing is that uh, these, these uh, therapies are being moved into other types of cancers as well. So things that happen, uh, you know, fund money that goes to fund uh, research in blood cancers uh, really gener uh, benefits the entire cancer community as, as a whole. Just to learn a little bit about targeted therapies, this came up in, that, in, in the particular uh, talk we, uh, video we looked at. Traditional chemotherapy kind of damaged the DNA. Cells are dividing here and what happens is we messed up the DNA and those cells had no choice but to die. Other cells are dividing as well too. So the idea of coming up with targeted therapies that maybe would go after a specific pathway within a cancer cell became very intriguing. If we could do something here to kill that cell, not kill other cells, maybe we could get some even further advances without causing fewer side effects. So that's one of the things and goals that we wanted to do rather than just kind of using traditional chemotherapy. And, but when we try to find those targets here, it's really quite complex. When we look at the entire human genome in general, and this is where all these things are that we have to take a look at, you know, we can think of the entire genome as, as uh, there's 23 pairs of books. Each chromosome is a book. Within that book, there are what we may call the genes. These genes are maybe the various chapters within it. There are 20 to 25,000 genes in, in uh, the human genome. And within those genes, if we think about, you know, the letters that are making up those chapters here, these are the different base pairs, the individual pieces of genetic information here, and there are 3 billion base pairs. What we can find is that you know, one of those things changing can change the behavior of a cancer cell. So this is what we're up against at this point in time. And when we look at how we've uh, made some advances over the past, one of our biggest favorite success stories is Gleevec. So Gleevec is a drug that inhibits an enzyme that helps the CML cell to grow. When we block that, we can inhibit the growth of the CML cell. It was approved in 2001. What we saw then is that we began to be improved in other different disease types, not only blood cancers, but also in other types of cancers too. And then we also saw this kind of result in the improvement or the approval of other second generation drugs. So we get one drug here, we can find out there's other ones that maybe work a little bit better. Things like Spricel or Tisigna would also approve for the treatment of CML based on some of this initial research. But there's kind of a, a dirty little story behind this whole thing when we look at this, when we look at CML and look at the history of this. 
So this was, we've known about CML for, you know, hundreds of years here, since the late 1800s. And uh, one of these might be a pointer, I'm not sure. But <clears throat> so the Philadelphia chromosome was the whole story behind this. And I'm afraid I'll turn off the slide if I push too many buttons. <laughs> so if you look down at the, at the last row there here, so these are the chromosomes, these 23 pairs of books. That 22, you can see, is too short. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> They found this in the 1960s. Um, in 1960, it was first reported by two investigators in Philadelphia. It became the Philadelphia chromosome. They saw this in CML patients. weren't really sure what to make of it. It was in, in 1972 that Janet Rowley, here a uh, Chicago-based investigator at the University of Chicago and a very prestigious investigator, found that that piece of chromosome 22 went to chromosome 9 and began to describe what we're seeing as a translocation. So what we're having or uh, one piece of a, a chromosome going to another one. Cells are dividing all the time. These things have the propensity to kind of overlap and cause these changes here. We found later here in more research is that what's occurring is that two genes were put next to each other that shouldn't be next to each other. So on the left-hand side, you see what a normal bind and normal 22 look like. When those cross over, what happens is you have those two genes, the BCR and the ABL, ABL kind, of, kind of getting close to each other. That creates an abnormal protein, and that abnormal protein is then is what kind of gives life to the CML cell, makes it begin to grow abnormally. And then in the late 1990s, you know, Novartis kind of searched their entire drug base here looking for specific drugs. They found something called STA 570, STI-571 that inhibits the CML cell. And then in 2001, we saw that we had Gleevec approved for the treatment of CML. Great victory, but if you're doing the math, that's 40 years. The time we first identified that chromosome abnormality and the time that we had the first approved drug. But things are different now too. So I'm not saying that to discourage you, I'm kind of telling you now this is the new path that we're on at this point in time. We know that when we look at the gene level of things, things are even a little bit more complex, you know, going down from the, the book now to the chapter. This is, this is a gene array, so this just looks at, it's hard to kind of get here what, what is happening, but there's these tiny little squares there. Each column is a patient, each row is a different gene, so we have the capacity to look at hundreds of genes in any particular patient. And when we look at this in a disease like multiple myeloma, which we consider to be one disease, when we look at it under the microscope, we can see that there's all sorts of different patterns of expression. So we're seeing certain genes may be turned on, certain genes may be turned off, and certain disease groups, we can ideally identify who's going to do well, who needs more aggressive therapy based on these, these profiles, but we also may be able to identify well, boy, you know, maybe these people should get this treatment and these people should get this treatment. So now we're getting to understand of these things at the gene-based level, too. So we're, it made some tremendous advances just in beginning to understand how diseases behave and, and what treatments we can use based on the gene level. But it also goes beyond that, too, going back to the, the concept of the, the Human Genome Project. What they wanted to do is they wanted to identify all of those DNA pairs in, in, in humans so that we can actually go back and you know, see what we can do to help advance every field of medicine in general. So they wanted to look at these three billion pieces of genetic code. This project was started in 1990 and was completed in 2003. 13, uh, <clears throat> 13 years, actually ended a little bit earlier. They thought it would take 15 years, but as technology improved, things got a little bit quicker. But also what they found is it took millions and millions of dollars to efforts of across the country, people coming together here to be able to do this in a 13-year period. What we now know is that we can do this relatively routinely. And one year ago in Nature, there was a paper published where they took myeloma patients, took their tumor cells, and then began to sequence the entire genome. So they began to look at this. And some patients in this room probably had some of their samples uh, sent from you know, our institution to be part of this pretty big project. And what this is, right now it gives us a bunch of information, this information we have to be able to synthesize and analyze. But what we found in doing this is that we found some genes that were abnormal that we didn't think would be involved in multiple myeloma. So we're identifying new targets based on these things. This initial series was about 30 patients. They're almost up to about 100 patients at this point in time. As we get more information, we're going to be able to identify more and more what our target should be and how we should go about it. So just in general, when we look at accelerating the cure, we looked at that 40-year period. Then, you know, it took 40 years from the identification of that uh, Philadelphia chromosome to the time that we had the first drug. Now, we have a multitude of genes that we know, and there are already some drugs you know, out there that are being screened 
that we know can be potential targets for this. It took 13 years and millions of dollars to sequence the entire human genome. Now, in about a week and maybe a little over a thousand bucks, we can get it done. So we're, we, we still have to get this information and know what to do with it. But the amount of things that we have available to us is amazing. And a lot of this information is available in public portals where scientists from around the world can come together and begin to search for things, too. Lastly, the differences in cancers. We know that not every myeloma patient is the same. Not every lymphoma patient is the same. And the, the only way we had to do it in the past was look under the microscope and say, oh gosh, this looks like this, looks look like this. But now we can under, understand these differences based on the genetic profile of the tumors. So it's changed dr dramatically even just in the last decade. So those advances that we had seen had really occurred with our kind of old way of doing things. And now as we have these new things available to us, as the LLS begins, continues to fund this type of research here, we're going to see tremendous advances really in the next generation overall. But the LLS does other things to kind of help our cancer patients. And that is uh, through a number of different programs. And I'll just highlight some of these. And afterwards, too, you can stop by the booth to get a little bit more information about things that we can offer you other assistance. Because when, you know, someone faces a diagnosis of a blood cancer, there's all so many other things that are going on, too. So many other needs, so many other financial needs, too, that we want to be able to offer you some assistance with. Education resources, that we have different programs, the Be Your Own Advocate program, we can give you a calendar, we can give you a booklet, the things that you can look at to make sure that you're getting all your questions answered, that you're getting all the information that you need. We have different education programs here, you know, much like we have here today. There are uh, booklets, maybe that's maybe how many of you first were introduced to the LLS, you were in your doctor's office, you were handed a patient information booklet here, on the back of it was stamped, you know, the LLS logo, and so you began to understand some of the resources that are out there available to you. There are the Information Resource Center. It's a, a staff by healthcare professionals and soon will be available 24 hours. So you wake up at 4 a.m., you're like, oh my God, what about this drug? I don't know if I should do this. There's someone you can begin to talk to at 4 a.m. if you want to, um, as soon as it goes live in a 24 hour period. So th those are all some resources that we have available too. We have peer-to-peer -peer support. Sometimes it's just nice to talk to someone or convene with someone who's been through the same thing. There are also family support groups because we know that blood cancers don't just affect an individual. They, they really kind of affect an entire family. So children, how do you talk to your children? How do you talk to your grandchildren? You know, how do you talk to anyone about this? You know, when you have all sorts of you know, uh, 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 feelings going on, you want to be able to have support for the family too so that everyone uh, can you know, really kind of survive uh, this process as unscathed as possible. Other things that we have available too are a number of different financial assistance. You know, we, we look at uh, the, the diagnosis of cancer, you know, we think of it's, it's you know, physically devastating, but also can be really quite financially devastating too. Even small things, you just can get, get nickel and dime, not even just with copays, but you know, parking, you know, when you go see the physician, you know, all these things can, can begin to add up and increase the cost. And there are financial assistance programs available um, um, on limited funds sometimes, but uh, it's always important to ask to see what's available to you at this point in time, and also the Copay Assistance Foundations. It's kind of discouraging because we've seen things move to kind of the inpatient, you know, the IV forms to the, the pill forms of chemotherapy in many different cases, and it doesn't seem like the insurance providers have really kind of caught up to that. Clearly, the federal government has not caught up to that and how to, to benefit that with the donut hole put in place, which kind of blows through that first month. So we have different uh, co-pay assistance foundations available for different patients, sometimes based on their disease types, too, to help with many of these co-pays and just in the, the high cost and the high financial burden that places on many of our patients, too. So with that, um, if there's any other questions about the patient services program, what we have to offer, Please, please, please stop by the table outside and you know, pick up a pamphlet, pick up some booklet, talk to our people there so that we can give you more information about the things that we can help you. And uh, if there's things that we, we're not able to do, we want to know what we can do so we can take it back to the main office and say, look at that, this is a need that we're seeing and to, so ideas that we can do to kind of help the next generation too. So with that, um, I would like to introduce the, the president of our Illinois board here, Dr. Uh, Scott Sachs. Um, who is a, a good friend and a diligent worker. So he has uh, done so much to really kind of help grow the Illinois board. I've been you know, duly impressed by the efforts that he's put forward. And with that, uh, thank you, Scott. <laughs>